Hello, everyone. My name is Hawa Diallo, and I am the chief of the Civil Society Unit in the UN Department of Global Communications here at the UN Headquarters, New York. Welcome to the department's uh, Civil Society Engagement Platform. Uh, I'm really delighted to be with you today uh, for our event. Uh, and uh, we are partnering um, with FIA Foundation for this virtual event. Uh, this is the engagement platform for the department really that reaches out to civil society entities to inform and raise awareness on UN issues. Now this platform features uh, only virtual events. However, we look forward to being with you through other session formats sometime in the future. It is nice to be here with you for the event, which is entitled Road Safety and Climate Change, Linkages and Challenges. As I mentioned, we are partnering with FIA Foundation, and this is in the lead up of the UN high level meeting of the General Assembly on global road safety that will take place from 30 June to 1 July. This high level meeting will focus on improving global road safety and securing political will and leadership on action and delivery of commitments that governments have made uh, towards this end. Now, in planning this session, um, you know, we did a bit of research, and I, you know, learned that according to the World Health Organization, an estimated 1.3 million people—that's about the population of the state of New Hampshire in the United States—die each year because of road traffic crashes and that more than half of road traffic deaths comprise the most vulnerable road users. That would be pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcyclists, with children and young adults being the most impacted. Now, when we did a deeper dive, I also learned that uh, in 2030, governments around the world set 2021 to 2030 as the decade for action for road safety establishing a target to reduce by at least 50% the number of road traffic deaths and injuries by 2030. These numbers are staggering. And it's these type of statistics that got me, Howard Diallo, not the person that works at the UN, but Howard Diallo, that's a mother, a wife, a sister, a friend, and a global citizen, really keen to learn more about road safety. Uh, with our research uh, into the linkages um, with, uh, uh, between road safety and the environment and the corresponding challenges that we face, I was even more excited to learn from experts and practitioners uh, on these topics. So judging from the number of viewers that we have online, it's safe to say that I'm not the only one uh, that's keen, uh, that has a keen interest in this topic. Today's event has a super great lineup of speakers from the UN system, civil society organizations that have a firsthand knowledge and experience uh, working uh, with various aspects and stakeholders focusing on investing in global road safety and addressing climate related issues. So I'm confident that our time together today will be informative and inspiring and you, because you'll be hearing from panelists that are really well versed on the subject matter at hand. So I look forward to hearing their perspectives on building partnerships, raising awareness, and on the different ways in which uh, we can create innovative infrastructure and sustainable transport initiatives and projects, especially in developing countries. As the global communication arm um, of the UN, my department is especially interested to learn about the various advocacy initiatives like the Street for Life and Love 30 campaign that inform, educate, and raise awareness and really inspire us to act for safer road conditions and climate conscious infrastructure investments for pedestrians and drivers alike. There are many virtual events that are happening today, right now at this moment, but you all chose to be with us today. So thank you to our viewers for making that choice to engage with us on road safety and climate change. You know, we, we are live right now on UN Web TV and on all the social media platforms, YouTube and Twitter. So be sure to spread the message and please do engage with us on today's theme in one of these platforms. Lastly, on behalf of the Department of Global Communications, 
I would love to express our gratitude to FIA Foundation for collaborating with us on this event and for the revolutionary work that they are doing in enhancing global road safety through practical measures, as well as engaging in research and innovative solutions that prioritize the environment. It is now my pleasure to welcome Avi Silverman, Deputy Director at FIA Foundation, to give his remarks. So what can I say? I think you all better sit back, relax, secure your seatbelts as we safely navigate today's theme. Take it away, Avi. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Hawa, for those uh, kind words. And thank you also in particular to uh, the UN uh, for, for this event today, this really important event, uh, and the department, uh, UN Department for Global Communications and Civil Society, um, for organising and hosting this. Um, we at the FIA Foundation, we're, we're delighted to be partnering uh, on this event. Um, just a very quick word about the FIA Foundation, as, as Howard brief, briefly mentioned. Um, we're a, a major global philanthropy working on road safety, uh, road traffic injury prevention uh, worldwide, and also on sustainable mobility and links to the to the climate agenda. We've been working on these issues for many years with um, supporting a range of major uh, international uh, organizations and partners. Uh, we've been advocating for road safety as a sustainable uh, development um, priority. And um, we've, we've been uh, advocating across with partners across low and middle income uh, countries for uh, increased levels of, of commitment an action on uh, to confront road traffic injury and also promote sustainable um, mobility. Um, the fact that, that this event is being held in itself is uh, a real reflection of, of the key priorities that these linked uh, issues are road safety uh, and climate. Um, just a word about road safety in particular, just to start off with, um, as, as Howard said, I mean, road safety is a sustainable development uh, priority now. There are um, uh, goals, targets on road safety in the health goal and also the city's goal, SDGs 3 and uh, 11. And uh, there's a real push with the, with the decade of action for road safety, an acknowledgement that we need to do much more um, to confront the burden of road traffic injury, uh, 1.3 million fatalities a year, tens of millions of injuries um, globally and the leading killer uh, of young people worldwide um, and you know we should we should really need little more reason to to confront uh, this issue and take it really incredibly seriously but there really isn't the level of um, commitment and financing in particular that is needed um, to address road traffic injury uh, worldwide and, and we want to see we and our partners want to see far more uh, commitment and, and action, which is why it's great that the UN uh, is holding the high-level meeting on road safety um, at the end of June, and I know there'll be more on that um, during this event today. Um, the connections really between road safety and climate are vital, and they're not always given the recognition um, that they that they need. Uh, one one big example is active travel, uh, walking and cycling. And as our, as our partners, as UN Environment, we work very closely with UN Environment and other major environmental um, organizations worldwide, as they would say, we really do need to see a huge transformative shift um, away from uh, car dependency, particularly in our cities, away from the big priority on, on private vehicles and on car, uh, car use worldwide and through to much more sustainable uh, means of transportation, of walking and cycling in order to reach the Paris climate change goals. This really does need to be um, much more of a, of a priority uh, than it is. And we really need to see a dramatic shift, but we're actually not going to see that shift unless we have safety uh, in place. And that, that's what leads us back into the need to protect um, vulnerable road users, pedestrians and cyclists, uh, worldwide. Uh, there needs to be much more investment in, in infrastructure for, for pedestrians and cyclists across low and middle income countries, 
that often even just isn't the infrastructure in place, even simple measures like um, safe sidewalks and crossings and safe cycle lanes um, globally, which are really vital um, measures that are needed to um, encourage walking and cycling and protect uh, vulnerable uh, road users. Um, and this leads us really on to civil society and the role of civil society. And it's excellent that there's, there's such a focus of civil society in today's, um, today's event. Um, civil society has a vital role to play, and we work very closely with uh, NGOs around the world, really pushing demand, uh, demanding um, higher levels of commitment from, from policymakers and from uh, those responsible for financing, um, focusing on advocacy, advocating for action, um, pushing for um, accountability and ensuring uh, delivery. And this week um, around the world, NGOs are joining together um, with a commit to act message and they've been campaigning for what has been an ongoing campaign um, over the past few months, so since last year actually, and through to this year with the high level meeting uh, with, a, with a united um, Streets for Life uh, message, calling for, for low speed, livable streets as a priority. And this is something that is really truly meaningful for, for people and communities around the world. Um, I think if the kinds of places that we work with and communities and NGOs that we work with, they'll all say that they want to see uh, more livable streets, um, lower speeds um, for, for their families. It's actually something that encourages economic uh, development um, as well uh, and uh, connects into so many other um, sustainable development priorities. Um, and of course, is vital in the in the fight on climate change, um, enabling us to move towards um, more sustainable transportation, public transportation, uh, walking uh, and cycling. So with the kind of role of civil society in mind, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our uh, moderator today from the uh, Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety, uh, Chika uh, Sakashita. Uh, she is um, a, a great partner of ours um, over many years and uh, I uh, in particular have been working with her in, in initiatives that we've been doing across Asia Pacific, which is been um, great work um, and she's a driving force on road safety uh, with the NGO Alliance um, globally. Uh, so great to have her guiding our discussion today and I introduce you to Chika. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Avi for that kind introduction and um, setting the scene and um, thank you also to Hawa for um, yeah, introducing um, this uh, very important session. Um, I'm very, I'm so very pleased to um, find that the UN Civil Society Unit, um, in collaboration with FIA Foundation, um, is taking the lead to bring our attention to both climate change and road safety, uh, both vital global agenda items. Um, they deservedly are incorporated in the Sustainable Development Goals as already highlighted by both Hawa and um, Avi. They're incorporated in SDGs 3, 11, and 13. Um, at a personal level, um, for me, uh, both road safety and climate change are two topics that I'm very passionate about and want to make a meaningful contribution. So I'm all the more um, very excited and honored to be part of this very important session on climate change and road safety. Uh, linkages and uh, challenges. So thinking about the commonalities between road safety and climate change, um, I think we all agree, um, hearing the, the stats that um, we have heard from Hawa and um, Avi, they both require urgent actions and actions that are involving implementation of interventions that deliver results. Results that is reduced emissions, reduced deaths, and injuries from road crashes. Keeping the current levels of um, emissions, tolerating the current atrocious numbers of deaths and injuries from road crashes. And we know that um, the deaths and injuries are suffered by the younger ones who are about to start to contribute to society 
make contribution to economic development. And so we are hindering our opportunities to um, create a, a thriving uh, society and um, economic growth. So without acting upon and, and not let alone the immediate, you know, the, the loss and the grief and the, and the suffering that we, we have to go through, through um, the death and injuries of our loved ones. So without these you know, urgent action to reduce the emissions and reducing the number of deaths and injuries, we're going to compromise our economic growth, our lives, our livelihoods and well-being. Yet, um, both climate change and road safety um, are uh, experiencing similar challenges. That's the lack of political will. Political will that's demonstrated by putting the finances, the resources into what works to reduce emissions and road deaths and injuries. And this is where civil society can play a powerful role. We can create the motivations for our political leaders, our decision makers to urgently act. And um, the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety um, has been making a lot of noise on road safety this week in particular. Um, you may have noticed the Twitter storm, uh, hashtag commit to act, hashtag streets for life. Um, as uh, as Avi has um, alluded to, and um, we, we are the uh, global network of road safety NGOs. We have been advocating for actions, um, real actions, meaningful actions for road safety that deliver results um, for more than 10 years now. And um, we have grown to a network of around 300 NGOs um, from around 100 countries, and we're continuing to grow. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to now introduce uh, the, our um, very special NGO road safety advocacy video, Commit to Act, Streets for Life, Calls to Action. It's a video that has been particularly designed and created for, to call for actions from our ministers, our decision makers, and decision influencers. So I would now like to ask for the video to be played, please. based on research and data, going towards intervention, okay, and then towards policy change. We demand a uh, door speed on the streets. Uh, why? Because this is the most effective way. I demand uh, um, there must be uh, investment in road safety. I call my government to invest more and to allow more budget and funds to road safety that can really save lives and then can really, uh, how can I say, increase our economy. Otherwise, we cannot uh, achieve our goal that 50% uh, reduction of death uh, by 2030. We want NGOs to be in the decision making. Thank you. So the three calls to action, the evidence-based intervention, investing in proven actions, 
and involving NGOs in decision making. I think these calls to action um, can easily apply to both climate change and road safety. We're privileged to have uh, three excellent panelists today, um, and we will uh, start with a presentation from um, he, he, to hear from each of the panelists first, and then we will move to the Q and A segment. Um, so. We will um, start now with, um, a, with our first panelist that we have today. Um, we have Aisaita Kamara. She's the Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Strategic Initiatives and Chief of Staff, Mayor's Office for International Affairs, New York City. Um, Aisaita will brief our New York City's global vision, urban action program, and the city's experience in addressing road safety and climate change from the perspective of increasing engagement with local and national governments. So Asaita, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Esteemed colleagues and guests, thank you uh, to the organizers, including my sister Hawa Jallo for inviting me to add the voice of New York City in this important discussion on climate change and road safety. I am honored to be here with you today. And again, I am Isata Kamara, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Strategic Initiatives, as well as the Chief of Staff in the New York City Mayor's Office for International Affairs. Our office serves as a link between New York City and the world, and we operate innovative programs and initiatives to achieve our goals, including the Global Vision Urban Action Program to foster the exchange of knowledge between local governments and to ensure cities' voices are heard. I am truly honored to be speaking in a forum with civil society because I am from this community. I know the passion that we all bring as organizations to issues, and I know that civil society is critical is a critical ally to governments and to the private sector in resolving issues facing us now and those that will continue to face us in the future. So if you haven't heard it lately, your voices as civil society matter and we are here to listen to you. Now let's shift to the themes of our gathering today, climate and road safety. As a global city, New York City has been leading on these issues because they affect our communities deeply. We also know that we are a global city and it is important for us to lead by example and to inspire other local governments to act by making our knowledge available and by also being humble to learn from our global counterparts. So when thinking about climate change, we see that climate disasters are becoming more frequent from Hurricane Sandy to Hurricane Ida, New Yorkers feel the deep impact of nature and are also facing the devastating losses of it, including the loss of life. And on road safety, statistics show that um, we are having decreasing numbers of fatalities across decades in New York. Yet they also show that approximately 3,000 New Yorkers are seriously injured and more than 200 are killed each year in traffic crashes. And being hit by a car is the leading cause of injury related death for children under 14 and the second leading cause of death for senior citizens. These facts are simply unacceptable and New York City had to act and we did and we continue to do so. On road safety, we instituted Vision Zero, a citywide initiative that refuses to accept the statistic that I mentioned earlier. And as a city, we believe that it is possible to prevent these crashes by focusing on engineering, enforcement, and education. Specifically, we have expanded enforcement against dangerous moving violations, such as speeding and failing to yield to pedestrians. We have also added new street designs and, config and configurations to improve safety. We have pushed for robust uh, legislation uh, in our agenda to increase penalties for dangerous drivers and to give New York City control over the safety of our own streets. As we transitioned to a new administration under Mayor Eric Adams, the commitment to road safety remained. 
Intersections are the leading site of pedestrian injuries and fatalities in New York. And the administration announced in January that the DOT, the Department of Transportation, will make design improvements to make 1,000 intersections safer with improved traffic signals, raised crosswalks, and other expanded pedestrian space and visibility measures. Last month, the administration also announced a historic investment of more than 900 million over five years to tackle the city's traffic violation crisis and deliver safer, healthier, and greener city for all New Yorkers. Now, if I were to shift over to climate change, or should I say climate actions that we are taking as a city and to protect our city and to protect our planet, we have many of examples that we could share. So let's think about the fact that right now, when we're thinking about climate change, we really all have to understand that this is acting is not a question of choice. Acting is a must do. We have no time to delay and we have to work on this, on this issue right away. So now we also know that for far too long, communities with a, major, with a majority of low income residents and a majority of people of color have experienced a, dispar a dis disproportionate share of poor environmental outcomes. These communities are often those with the least amount of power and contribute less to environmental degradation. But oftentimes, they're always the ones that are taking the brunt of the damage. And we know that we cannot solve climate-related issues if we don't address the socioeconomic factors that drive it. And in New York City, we take these factors into account as we design policies and initiatives. New York City is a proud member of C40 and other climate-focused groups. And we have worked closely with stakeholders to ensure we increase action and strengthen the resilience of our communities. We believe in accountability, and we believe that accountability is the first step in reversing the damages of, that have been done to the climate. And so as a city, we divested billions of our pension funds from fossil fuels. We are also committed to the tenets of the Paris Climate Accord. And in January, the mayor announced the appointment of his climate leadership team that is tasked with focusing on environmental protection and on environmental justice across New York City. These are respected leaders who will move New York City into a greener and resilient future. And last month, the administration also launched on Earth Day a new initiative called Building Action New York City, which will support build buildings in making energy upgrades. This initiative will make our buildings more resilient and it will create thousands of green jobs and support the long-term development of a green workforce. In addition, it will provide property managers and developers access to free support to reduce carbon emissions lower costs and comply with local laws. And when thinking of climate, we must also think about our consumption. And that's why this month we announced that New York City will join London and 13 other cities in the C40 Good Food Cities Declaration to increase access to balanced and nutritious food and to ensure that New Yorkers are wasting less food. These are just some of the actions that we are taking as a city on road safety and on climate. But there is more to do, and we need everyone at the table. We strongly believe that, that the Sustainable Development Goals give us a good roadmap for understanding how we could shift our cities and our countries into a safer and greener future. And this is why we are also committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. And we count on all local governments to join us in making a similar commitment. So again, road safety and climate issues are important and we must take action right away to ensure that we protect our communities and that we build the resilience of our communities. But in doing this work, we cannot just sweep the wrongs of the past under our rug. We must face them and we must ensure that we are working towards equity and that we are working towards a greener future. I thank you all for listening to me and I look forward to the continued discussion.
Thank you so much, Aisata. It's um, really encouraging to um, hear that New York City is taking the lead in um, creating systemic changes. Um, really pleased to hear the road design um, improvements that you are targeting based on data um, and, and the systemic changes that you're making for climate change by building um, more resilient buildings um, in response to climate change, but also making it greener. Um, so uh, we can um, come back to um, uh, more about what you're doing um, through the Q&A segment. Um, I will now introduce our second panelist. So we have um, Shihab Abub Ziad. Zaid. Um, he's the program manager from Nada Foundation for Safer Egyptian Roads. Um, he's one of our uh, proud and valued members of the Global Alliance of NGOs for Road Safety. Um, Shihab will um, brief on youth advocacy and share his own experience in creating community mobilization and building partnerships on both individual and organizational levels. So we're ready to hear from you, Shihab. Thank you so much, Chika. Um, good morning and uh, good afternoon and good evening to all of your respected selves and uh, to all participants from different time zones. Today, climate change and road traffic fatalities and the injuries are a growing public health concern, a social inequality issue and a threat to sustainable development goals. Why? The lack of sustainable and the foil efficient transportation options is directly correlated to changing climate conditions socioeconomic setbacks and the challenges faced by global economies. The mobility systems truly based on safety will have a holistically beneficial impact on our health, our environment, reducing the social and economic toll taken by road safety crashes, and on women's role in our mobility and transport systems. In 2021, a young group representing three Egyptian civil society entities, the Nada Foundation for Safer Egyptian Routes, Tabdil, and Transport for Cairo, so to help com communities that want a safer, more livable street environment, to encourage safe non-motorized active transportation, as well as more efficient modes of transportation, thus improving living conditions for road users and urban residents, as well as have a positive impact on the environment and the quality of life for all. The Emerging Alliance developed the Art for, for Vulnerable Road Users project and won the Local Action Award in 2022. Empowered by the Global Youth Coalition for Road Safety, the Art for, for Vulnerable Road Users is a project empowering youth and mobilizing peers in carrying out innovative action, awareness actions on active mobility, as well as the right of the youth uh, vulnerable road users in Cairo and engaging them in graffiti artwork production. After then, advocating for youth involvement in sustainable transport policy development and implementation. Young people are identified as key stakeholders in the delivery of the new global plan of action for road safety and the implementation of national strategies. We, the young people, have the right to participate and take action at all stages and levels of policy making and decision making processes on equal terms with adults. It's a crucial policymakers take a holistic approach and see how road safety and secure mobility greatly impact the achievement of a number of SDGs, including poverty, education, good health and well-being, sustainable cities and communities, climate action, and gender equality. We call for meaningful use engagement mechanisms at the local and regional decision-making level to address specific road safety and, and the environmental concerns within the implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of NDCs ahead of COP27. It would be great to see youth delegates as part of the official delegations of countries at COP27 to provide a, a fresh perspective on the future of mobility from the generations that will inherit the outcomes of decisions made today about climate policies and the safety of the evolving transport system. We look forward to our continued collaboration with the governments as well as our partners in the private sector, academia, international organizations and civil society to work together towards a greener, more sustainable future for our people and our planet. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Shihab. It's great to have the voice of the youth. And um, it is fantastic that you are um, bringing 
um, attention to climate change, the need to act for climate change and road safety um, and, um, from the youth perspective. And um, thank you for all your efforts. Um, so next we have um, Maleki um, uh, Kayesi. Uh, he's the technical officer of safety and mobility unit, um, Department of Social Determinants of Health from the World Health Organization. Um, Maleki will brief on the decade of action for road safety 2021 to 2030 and how the global plan for the decade of action aligns with the Stockholm Declaration connecting road safety to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So Maleki, please give you the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So wonderful to be discussing road safety, climate change, and such great energy and input. One other question, really a fundamental question we need to ask, did we need a second decade of action on road safety? And the answer is yes, because we had one from 2011 to 2020. However, at the end of the first decade, the number of people killed around the world was still high. We've already had the figure, 1.3 million people and several other millions that are injured. We are talking about long-term effect disability, the burden on families and burden on society. So there was no way we could let this just continue. Action was needed very urgent action. And this is why we had the second decade of action uh, on road safety. Uh, the mandate for this comes from the UN resolution uh, that clarified, proclaim a decade of action. Secondly, it set a very clear target, 50% reduction in road death and injuries by 2030. And it mandated WHO and the UN regional commissioners to prepare a plan of action to provide a framework or a means or a tool that can be utilized. Uh, so what is in this plan exactly? What is the plan talking about? Um, we need to point out that uh, the plan is not at all claiming to find one fees all document or uh, that a document that answers all the context, all the realities, all the situations in the world. However, it's basically a blueprint offering guidance, offering solutions, offering examples that can be utilized. So it's important for each city, for each country to adapt what is available, but of great importance as we've had uh, from New York, it's important that the city and the country develop what is appropriate. As we have heard from Egypt, it's important that these solutions are tailored and contextualized in order to be meaningful to each country and each city. However, the general principles, there are certain specific areas of action. We have five key ones that are highlighted here, which are coming from extensive synthesis of the evidence and the experience of several countries. The first area is on multimodal transport planning and land use. Emphasizing that uh, what we are witnessing in as uh, road traffic crashes have a large source in the way we plan the, the use of our land in urban areas, in the way we have planned the transport system that leads to death. So really the a very crucial foundation is to pay attention to the land use planning as well as the transport planning in any country or in any city. Secondly, the plan highlights various solutions that are necessary for safer road infrastructure. 
The third component are safer vehicles, pointing out the importance of technology, the importance of standards, design standards that are required for vehicles in order to make sure that they are safe. And the fourth component is safe road use, looking at various uh, regulations, laws uh, that need to be enforced in order to deal with the crashes. These are related to speeding, drink driving, seat belt use, et cetera. And the fourth, the, the fifth one I mean is the post-crash care, which recognizes that uh, though we may really wish the ideal is to prevent crashes, death, from occurring, but the reality is that they do occur. So society has to prepare to provide care, rehabilitation for those that are injured and need to be supported. The, the plan goes further to point out that uh, for this to happen, we need legal frameworks, we need funding or financing, we need political will, as has been pointed out clearly. We need the capability and the capacity. As I listen to the conversation, you can see that capacity is so crucial, both the human and the financial capability in a country. And there are other issues that are highlighted the importance of equity and the importance of gender in order for us to deliver. So we have the various actions but then the plan points out that um, it's important for us to think of the enabling factors, the enabling systems that can deliver these actions because they don't occur in a vacuum. They really need to be taken and implemented. So the reality is that uh, we still have a couple of years to go. This is 2022. We have eight years and the question we need to be asking ourselves is when we evaluate this in 2030 or midway in 2025, where will my city be? Where will my country be as far as road safety is concerned? Will the figures have gone up? Will the infrastructure still be contributing to death? Will my government, my leaders have allocated resources, or shall we be in a worse state? So this really points out to a very crucial issue, the need for sustained action. We cannot belabor this. I think it's been made very clear, but we need to reiterate that we need to mobilize. We need to do all that we can. I see the passion, the energy, Let's continue to drive and give the best as we, we confront this issue. I think the recent evaluation about the SDGs uh, 2020 report from the UN shows that uh, all of them except two are not yet, are not on track. There are only two targets, the under fives and the access to universal education. So you can see even our own, the road safety target is not on track. This should really challenge us to, to converse, but also to find more strategic, creative ways to get these solutions that are before us into action. So once again, thank you. And let us continue with our concerted efforts to deliver a 50% reduction in global road death and injuries by 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meliti, for giving us that overview and, um, and reminding us that yes, the last decade, we, we did have a target and we did have an agenda, but we didn't quite achieve it. And so this decade is really our, our new challenge and um, we need, sustain actions that are evidence-based. And, and I think we are we have improved on setting targets and that we need to do something. And I think now we are down to the level of what is it that we need to do exactly to reach that 50% reduction target by 2030. It's the what and who's gonna do it and when are we gonna do it by. 
and we really, without having those kind of accountability aspects, um, we won't be able to deliver the 50% reduction target. So um, yeah, we have a, a big task ahead of us. Um, but with that, um, I'd like to um, move to the next segment, which is the Q&A, the, um, the most, uh, I guess, in the interactive part. And, um, and we've been receiving um, very um, interesting and insightful questions um, from our viewers. And um, some of them um, have been fortunate to um, participate online to directly ask the question. So I will start with those who are here online and are able to ask the question themselves. So I will introduce our first um, civil society representative, um, Louisa Giwa. She's from the Research Center for Energy Efficiency and Sustainability, Greens from Brazil. Um, so I will um, ask uh, yeah, uh, Louisa to um, ask the question, please to our panelists. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. So my question is the following. It is recognized the huge negative impacts of carbon emissions resulting for transportation from private use vehicles to trucks involved in activities essential to society, such as food transportation food transportation. Nowadays, there is technology available to promote clean transportation, but on the other hand, full efficient vehicles tend to be very expensive, especially in developing countries. What are the types of public policies countries can implement to make this type of technology more accessible to everyone? Thank you. Thank you very much, Louisa, for that um, question. Um, so yeah, very um, important question. So the question is, what are the public policies countries can implement to make fuel efficient and clean transportation technology more accessible to everyone? So um, perhaps uh, uh, Isaita, uh, you may like to um, follow the lead and um, give us some insights in, from your ex experience, please. Um, thank you so much for asking that question, Louisa. And uh, it's one that we all have to think about, not just as countries, but also as local governments in order to make sure that we're um, helping our communities transform the, their habits as we tackle climate change and ensure that we are really at the forefront of, of, of a lot of these issues. So let me first say this. As I mentioned in my remarks, we can't talk about any of these issues if there's not a conversation around equity, right? So even before you start thinking about owning a car, you first have to have a sustainable mode of transportation that is publicly available. So the first thing that I think that governments have to do is to invest in their infrastructure, is to invest in making sure that their bus routes, in making sure that their train routes are safe and that they come on time so people are not late to their jobs because they need to make an income and that they're reliable. So that's the first step. Then when we look at electrical vehicles and the idea of moving uh, into that next stage of our lives, we have to make sure that we provide subsidies, that we provide incentives as well. So subsidies so that if individuals cannot pay uh, the amount that the governments are able to take on some of that cost, because we know that when we take it on, we're also saving money when we look at the climate disasters and the different disasters that we're preventing. Then the next thing is to incentivize. Why should a person leave their current mode of transportation to go and have an electrical vehicle? Um, giving them the right reasons and speaking to people from the language that they understand is also very important as governments, right? What are the equities that you're bringing into my life that will want, make me want to take on this electrical vehicle? Then the final thing, uh, in my opinion, is also to be able to make it sustainable. So in a lot of projects that I see uh, across the world with government, sometimes it's that at the outset, when the attention is there, there's a lot of investments, but then afterward, the investments lack. 
So we have to invest if we are going to have electrical vehicles and making sure that we have charging stations that are accessible and that are everywhere so that when you take on these cars, you're able to charge in safe spaces. But that also as these cars are, you know, get old, do we have new incentives to still help those community members to still be able to have access to that? So I know I've given you a lot, but these are very nuanced um, issues, and I really think that we have to think about them from a very broad perspective that accounts both equity, but also incent incentives. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing those um, uh, smart strategies. Um, and we, we do need to, and I think public transport is really a, a, a huge opportunity for us. And it's um, it's kind of unfortunate that uh, the private vehicle use has become such the, you know, the, the main thing and the popular thing. But I think we are starting to recognize the benefit of public transport and, and why it's good for road safety. It's good for climate change and it's more equitable. It's more accessible for people. And I think to make public transport as, as attractive as possible, by reducing the, the fares, the costs, um, that it's economical, but also being on time. So it's not a frustrating mode of transport and um, that people can learn to rely on it. Um, so I think that kind of um, in integrating public transport in our everyday lives, um, and then that to use public transport, we need um, people to be able to walk to the trains, walk to the bus, cycle to the train stop or the bus stop, walking and cycling also have to be sustainable, um, safe and sustainable. So I think they're the, uh, the three key things, the public transport, walking and cycling, and that's where building the cities, the road designs, the, the infrastructure to make all those modes of transport to be more attractive than so that people opt to choose public transport, walking and cycling instead of private car use. So thank you for that. And um, perhaps maybe Shihab, um, from your, like you say, um, you mentioned that uh, youth bring fresh perspectives. You, you're calling for holistic approach. Is there anything from um, the youth group that you would like to comment on this aspect, please? Okay. Uh, however, there is no uh, an easy answer for uh, Louisa, important question. Uh, but uh, as it is stated many times today that uh, we need political will. Uh, and the only way to measure the political will uh, is uh, financing and the uh, budget and uh, the allocated budget. budget. Uh, so uh, the country uh, has to put uh, incentives for implementing technologies that promote uh, clean transportation. So uh, we think that there is, the, there is a need to reduce taxes uh, on electric vehicles, for example, and uh, subsidize public transportation, and uh, for sure, uh, congestion taxes in crowded uh, cities. That's my perspective. Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. And uh, yeah, the, the congestion tax, yeah, may, make it private car use um, unattractive. I think the other thing that we don't like but can work to reduce car travel is parking um, fees. <laughs> you have to pay for parking and, and people choose not to drive anymore and go, oh, maybe I should take public transport instead. Um, yeah, and, um, and green vehicles. And I think, um, yeah, the, the, the the synergies between climate change and road safety is really promoting um, the consumer choice for green and safe vehicles. And in road safety, we have um, safety star ratings. Um, and I think there's, and you know, global NCAP and a, a lot of the NCAP groups have been promoting the star rating of vehicles. Um, but I think uh, we are still, a lot of us are still choosing cars, not based on the safety rating, but something else. Um, it may be what's being advertised, what's cool and whatnot. But I think we need to make safe and green vehicles cool so that everyone starts choosing that. And also not just about the influence in the consumer choice, but also how do we regulate? How do we, how, how do the governments regulate? And maybe you put more tax on unsafe cars and less green cars so that people choose um, but cost-wise, that you know, if, if the safer and the greener cars are cheaper, then people will choose. And I think that's something that governments can regulate. So that's another public policy area that we can change. Um, Maleki, um, you've touched on multimodal um, transport and land use and um, all the uh, cornerstones of the global plan. Is there something you would like to add uh, on, on this question from Louisa? Yes, uh, really. Uh... 
emphasize what my two panelists have highlighted, the, the planning aspect, the deliberate planning. And I need to point out that in the global plan, there is strong emphasis on model shift, which really will vary from one country to another. But I really like the answer that we've got from New York. How are we planning? What are we thinking about the infrastructure? Uh, which city, which region are we planning about? Are we still thinking of yesterday? Or are we thinking of a future city? How will it look like? And this really requires uh, better strategy, better decision making, and the investments we need to make now. Because I think this is what is challenging uh, as we tackle this. And so the multimodal, if you look at the global plan, has quite a, a, a section that is devoted to this. And it brings together not just road safety, but other aspects. This is uh, environment or the ecology. It brings together the economy. And so if you could get more examples, I often rely on New York. I look at Curitiba, I look at Singapore, several cities that are making an effort to show us how we can plan efficient, transport systems, mass transit others, that can shift the, the travel patterns, the model use to us more sustainable. I always like this example where, you know, a bus can accommodate so many people are using the private car. As it's been pointed out, how do we get to that is so challenging because there are many factors that pull people to the private car or push them away from the public transport. So my question is, how do we design and develop public transport systems that are just as attractive as the car so that uh, we can have a future sustainable city? So I'm really emphasizing that we need to dream that future now. We need to envision it, not wait for 50 years, but can we do it now. How can we push for this right now so that uh, 20, 30 years from now, we have a livable, vibrant uh, city structures? Thank you. Thank you, Maleki. Yes, um, absolutely. And uh, I think, yeah, we do need to start now in, in small steps. And, and uh, if we do these small steps, um, Consistently, then we will have these livable city that um, that you are uh, articulating for us. And I, I think um, you you will notice that the road safety NGOs have been heavily advocating for 30k. And um, 30k is one of the way to promote um, public transport, walking, and cycling. So 30k creates that environment where people feel like they can use public transport, walk safely, cycle safely, um, but also can inadvertently put off car drivers who feel that 30K is too slow. And so they might as well walk, they might as well cycle. And so 30K is, is one of the things that we can um, start putting more of in the cities and, um, and yeah, and, 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 and build from that. And that's an evidence-based action that we can start with um, that will both benefit climate change and road safety. Um, I'm curious to hear, Isata, because you were talking about the city design um, and, um, and I know you were targeting of um, inter intersection improvements. Um, is there any plan for um, making 30K zones a, a, and expanding 30K zone, or, or perhaps maybe the whole of New York City could be 30K zones, given how much Manhattan is so condensed and, um, and there are a lot of walkers and public transit, you know, metro riders, right? So love to hear uh, your views on that, please. Yes, um, thank you for that uh, question. I think that New York City by design, we've been, we've had to have public transit because again, we, we, we're a city of 8.8 .8 million people. Um, and that's usually the size of many countries. So we're a city country, as we like to say. And uh, 
when it comes to the idea of making New York City more walkable, more biker friendly, we've taken a lot of um, initiatives to do so. As you look around New York City, you will see a lot of new bike lanes that have been put into place. I think the last time that I looked at our statistics, we had um, implemented or added in about 225 new miles of bike lanes to make it easier for people in New York City to be able to bike. And then obviously walkability is also very important um, and the ability to walk safely. So I think this is where issues of quality of life and issues of public safety become very important. And as, a, as an administration as a, and as a city, we've taken those things into considerations, right? Um, and from a gender perspective, that also becomes a very important issue. So when you walk across New York City, you have lampposts that allow you to see where you are. When you are waiting at bike stops, you have bus shelters and you have lampposts and you have you have to have this increased sense of safety for you to be able to want to walk and for you to be able to take public transportation. Obviously, as a city, we're still walking, working towards being even better than we are right now, uh, because I think that that is what it means to be a good local government. You have to always improve. So I think we have a lot more work that we are going to continue to do, and that we are also open to learning from our colleagues around the world that are doing this even better than we are. But I think also one thing that I will add when we think about mobility is also accessibility, right? We have people in New York and around the world that are disabled. And as we are talking about uh, increasing walking spaces and we're thinking about um, access to public transportation, we also have to, to design these spaces for all people. And that includes people with disabilities. So as a city, when we think about the MTA, even though we don't fully control the MTA, we have to make sure that elevators work so that people could get onto the train. We have to make sure that our uh, streets, the way that we design our streets, allow for wheelchairs to be able to move easily. So designing our city is very important. We're working on it. We're doing a lot of good stuff. And learning from others has been really humbling and really powerful uh, in terms of how can we do even more. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Asaita. And um, it's uh, very um, actually inspiring to see the lead um, from New York City. It's such a big city country, as you say, and um, it's going to impact so many lives and so many people's um, livelihoods. So it's really important that um, you are continue to take the good small steps that will accumulate over time and, and make even bigger and bigger impact as you um, improve um, all your uh, uh, interventions and actions. Um, so I think we'll move to the next question. Um, we have um, a question from, uh, so one person who's um, joining us today, I think Christabel um, Oputo Omondi, she's um, joining us today. Um, so she's from MindScope Events Kenya. Um, would you like to um, state your question to, the, to our panelists, please? Um. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting and uh, very educative presentation. Coming from a background of Kenya, where there's a lot of development in um, new roads, new styles of <clears throat> which we've never seen before. Uh, my question is: How can speed management play a role in improving road safety, uh, reducing harmful vehicle emissions, and providing an environment where people who want to walk and cycle more in the new road system and enjoy their, 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 their journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christabel. Um, and, and thank you for um, putting a spotlight on the possible co-benefits of speed management. Um, and co-benefits meaning that it will benefit both climate change and, um, and road safety and, and possibly even other sustainable development goals. So I'm curious to hear um, from all of you. And uh, so I, I, I don't know, I think I, I say to you, because you, you're doing a lot of the infrastructure uh, um, developments in your city, perhaps we'll start off there and then we'll um, 
go around the other panelists too about the role that fee management can play in um, improving road safety, reducing vehicle emissions, and providing an environment where people want to walk, cycle. Uh, so, yes, please, Asaita. Thank you. Um, thank you for this question. Again, I. I'm really loving all of the questions that are coming from civil society. Uh, and again, I'm excited because I come from you and I am not at all surprised. So let's um, talk about um, the improvement of speed and how that actually then ends up improving everything else. So in New York City, we have continuously um, reduce our speed limit in order to ensure that we also decrease fatalities when there are car crashes and when people and cars meet. So that's the first thing, right? It's, it's a matter of safety, first of all, that we're doing it. And we want to make sure that because of the fact that, again, crashes occur and we work very hard to make sure that they don't, that if they do occur that, you know, based on physics, if you hit someone at a higher speed, then you have a higher chance of causing uh, fatality. So as a city, I'm really proud of the work that we've done there. And when it comes to how that then relates to being able to enable people to uh, walk and cycle, I think that they go right hand in hand. Uh, when you look at the different bike lanes, you have to be able to have a space where cars are able to slow down enough to allow for people and to allow for bikes to be able to also go on. We have to share our streets uh, is the thing that we like to say. But also, I think that the speed management also affects bikes, right, and cyclists. Um, if you are in New York City and you see certain bikers, sometimes they do go very fast. So it's not just about reducing um, the speed limit of cars, but it's also about making sure that when people are on bikes and on other modes of transportation, that they're also being mindful of the people that are walking and to also ensure that when people are walking, that they're mindful of the others that are on the road. So a lot of education campaigns go into making sure that people are not walking and texting um, as they're crossing the street and that they're also focusing on everything around them. But this is, this is critical and this is something that we want to continue to do more. And also it's not just in New York City, but I know of other cities that are doing similar things, reducing uh, the speed of all modes of transportation to ensure that we increase the safety of people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asata. Um, and yeah, absolutely. It's, it's plain physics, as you say, uh, speed. <laughs> it's the kinetic energy. It's going to kill our vulnerable human bodies. Um, we just cannot survive the force of crash forces. Um, and whether we are in um, it, New York or Egypt or Geneva, Brazil, um, you, you know, whatever country you're from, that, that law of physics applies. And so the speed management is actually, um, we can almost call it as a universal intervention. Lower speed limits save lives, and it also reduces emissions. Um, and I know um, Maleki um, from WHO, it's, it, there's been a strong push for lower speeds, um, and, uh, and it's also reflected in the global plan. So love to hear from, from you and giving us some guidance on um, effective speed management, please. Oh, thanks a lot. I mean, the the science, the evidence is well established. Uh, we need to lower the speed. The challenge we are faced with is actually doing it. How do we get action? And the crystal ball on that, I'm based in Geneva, I work for WHO. I come from Kenya, my home country. <laughs> and uh, so I can speak to that, uh, having also done some some of my research on Kenya. The, the, I think the challenge we have is to then make sure that the new road designs, the extensive, I think we've had about 18,000 kilometers of new road construction in the last eight years. Very massive. Uh, think of thick uh, highway, the, the Mao, Mao Road. The main, the main concern is the extent to which they are incorporating speed into the design. And I think as you can see from thicker highway, this is missed. 
uh, of course, it's a highway. So, but then there are many others where we live in the facilities for the pedestrians. So I think from really your work, you there's a quite a huge amount of work. Your work is well cut out. Let's push to ensure that the extensive road construction going on in Kenya takes into yeah. account speed management. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Maliki. And um, yeah, that's, um, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's nice to hear that Kenya is um, uh, uh, doing such thing. And um, it, it, I want to um, highlight, uh, as you mentioned, highway, that um, the International um, Energy Agency, um, they have a 10 point plan to cut oil use. And the first thing they say as part of the 10 point plan, how do we reduce oil use is to lower speeds by at least 10 kilometers an hour on highways because high speeds, um, it, it is not fuel efficient. And, um, and we know that um, high speeds also kill. And, um, as, and there's a, a good um, evidence that the, the curve is well known, the exponential at um, even at uh, 70K an hour, the crash force, um, you have a 90% likelihood of dying if um, you get hit at the 70K. So, um, and the roads and are not designed to, to, for people to be able to survive when you are, like, when you're involved in a crash of 100K, um, and many roads are not to, up to that standard and, and neither are the vehicles that um, people are still driving. So it's really important that we, um, it, it's one of the immediate actions that we can do, reduce um, speed limits on our highways um, to benefit both climate change and road safety. Um, maybe Shihab, you might be able to share some experience from Egypt or from, uh, from, from, from the voice of the youth. Um, love to hear from you. Yes, yes, I wanted to highlight uh that the mobility uh, holds the key to addressing uh, many of the environmental challenges facing the world today. If we change the mobility paradigm from moving the maximum number of vehicles to moving the, ma the maximum number of people, the philosophy of public space um, uh, and understanding that public space is not mainly created uh, for vehicles, uh, there is a need to reclaim public space in favor of people uh, in favor of many other activities in addition to transportation. So uh, through a holistic approach across infrastructure design, safer vehicles, safer road users, uh, safe speeds and post-crash care, it is possible to save lives and to create a sustainable urban mobility uh, system as well that accelerates uh, uh, decarbonization by supporting eco-mobility and micro-mobility. Yes, this is what I wanted to highlight. Thank you very much for um, making that um, important point. Um, uh, and uh, I just realized that we have um, uh, 18 minutes left and, um, and there's some more questions. So I thought um, we might move to um, uh, the next question. Um, Ediola, she, um, Pashola Ri, um, she has a question, but she's unable to join us online. So I will um, ask the question on behalf of um, Ediola, who is from World Assembly of Youth in Albania. Um, her question is, what effects do transportation improvements have on climate change? And how involved are young people on those procedures and decisions? So it's a two-part question. What effects do transportation improvements have on climate change? And second, how involved are the young people? Um, Shehab, I think this question is made for you. <laughs> Would you like to take it? You're muted, Shihab. Shihab, you're muted. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I would love uh, to start with uh, the second point because it's a twin question. So uh, on the individual level, I think that we can uh, make a small difference by changing our behaviors such as use the public transportation instead of private cars, uh, depend more on active mobility. But uh, uh, the most important and influential are the policy making and decision making processes. Um, as youth will inherit the outcomes of decisions made today about climate policies and the safety of uh, the evolving transport system. Um, and that's why uh, they should be asked about their needs and, and their perspective about the future of mobility 
to guarantee a meaningful engagement uh, away from any source of tokenism or manipulation, uh, participation for show only. And this is uh, my answer for the second point. Uh, regarding the first point, I already uh, said that we need to uh, shift our uh, uh, do um, um, uh, a shift, mood shift in our paradigm um, from moving the, the maximum number of vehicles to moving the maximum number of people. Um, and that's what I, I think uh, about uh, this question. Yes, absolutely. I think um, we have become more and more uh, cost centric in, in our um, policy making decisions. And I think we, we need to go back to the people and moving the, the people and, um, and protecting our people. Uh, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> I think that, yeah, you make a, an, an excellent point. Um, uh, Maleki, um, is, is there something that you would like to add on either part of the questions? Yes, I'd like to answer the first part. There'll be major benefits if we improve our transport. The main concern from research and uh, experience is that it is not happening as it should because transport remains a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and carbon dioxide. So I'm kind of asking the question again, why is transport a very persistent contributor to greenhouse gas emissions or carbon dioxide emissions when this is what we are looking for? So the, the potential benefits are very clear, but the sector has not transformed itself to play that crucial role. Absolutely, Maleki. And I think um, the when we look at the sources of emissions around the world, the transport plays a huge role. And then within transport, it's the road transport that makes the majority of the emissions within transport. And then when we look at within the road transport, it's actually the private car use that makes the biggest um, emissions. So I think, yeah, what we've been talking about, a modal shift to public transport, walking and cycling, and how we make that attra attractive and incentivize um, that choice um, through public policies. I think that's really the, um, the key that gets uh, highlighted in, in this uh, discussion. Um, is there something that you would like to add to this too, Aisata? It, it, either part of the question? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I think that one key thing about climate and transport, I see that even more when I go back home and I'm from the Republic of Guinea. And when I'm there and I'm inside uh, the different cars and I could then see all of the fumes coming out of the cars. And I think that is the perfect image of being able to understand how our transportation and our transportation choices then affect our environment, right? Um, from, from that perspective also, it's not just affecting our environment, but it is affecting our health. It is not healthy for our people, our communities to be inhaling all of these fumes uh, just because they're trying to get from point A to point Z. So it's on all local government, it's on all national governments to really think about ways that they could invest in their infrastructure to make sure that their communities are not facing these risks. Young people are at the heart of all of these discussions. And I think as someone who has been a youth activist within the UN system, and then now I might be in older youth, but I'm still a youth. Um, I think that we have to understand that when we're in the room and when we're having conversations and when we're invited to sit at the tables, that we're not just being tokenized. And when we are at the table, we have to speak up, we have to demand for accountability because at the end of the day, the older generation is going to leave us with a lot of these problems. And we have to be with them now to learn about the mistakes that they made, but also about the innovations that they were able to create so that we could create an even better future. And that is why young people need to be involved. And that is why I love the work that the UN does and the work that our specifically is doing because she's always surrounded by young people and she's always bringing them to the table and that's what it takes because this issue is not going to go away if we silo ourselves 
It's not going to go away if we don't bring women to the table. It's not going to go away if we don't bring people with disabilities uh, to the table. But it's definitely not going to go away if we don't have the young voices in the room. So yay, young people. Thank you very much, Aisata, and uh, and um, emphasizing what she have is has been advocating for. You know what what we decide today, the young people are going to inherit. So we have to do well. We we have we all have to carry the responsibility for our future generations. Um, thank you very much. So we have another question um, from Ayub Al uh, Kazemi um, from Improve Your Society organization from Yemen. Um, and uh, I don't think Ayub is online either, so I will ask the question on her behalf. Um, so the question is, how can CSOs, so civil society organizations, contribute to the field of road safety? The interest in civil society organizations is still weak in this field, especially in conflict areas around the world where risks are increasing and threatening societies. Is it possible to launch a civil society network to exchange experiences in the field of road safety? Well, actually, coming from the Global Alliance, I must say <laughs> we are the network to exchange experiences in the field of road safety, but maybe there are other networks that are available um, that um, we, the panelists can share. Um, Shihab, since you're in the um, leading an NGO community yes. in, in Egypt, perhaps, yes. Yes, it's uh, a, a fundamental question uh, because, uh, and I, I totally understand this question because I live the same condition here in Egypt. Um, uh, we, we as, as a NADA foundation and um, and um, any Egyptian civil society, we are welcome to to make uh, any part of organizing ourselves, and that's what we already do in 2021 by launching the uh, Alliance of uh, Safe Roads for All, we organized ourselves and uh, this makes you uh, uh, more uh, power and provide you with more strength to achieve what you want and do what you believe. So uh, we can organize ourselves in the local level and also in the regional level to have more influence uh, on decision-making uh, process. That's my short answer for uh, this uh, fundamental question. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Um, and yeah, local regional level um, and having that uh, specific voice is really important from our civil society. So thank you very much. Um, Maleki, um, I know WHO is uh, you know, advocating on behalf of the um, civil society. It's mentioned in the global plan as well that civil society has a role in contributing to the reduction of 50% um, of and uh, um, of deaths and injuries. Um, is there anything that um, you, you can uh, recommend um, from your perspective, please? Quite correct, that is so, is so crucial. When you look at uh, the enablers, we look at sharing responsibility for road safety. So we have government and non government, state owned and state actors and the civil societies are a very critical player here. So please continue. Uh, you can see there is space and for the civil society, the private sector, we need every agent. We need everybody, every institution, every organization. So the basic principle is that it's a shared responsibility. There is enough room for very many agencies here and the civil society is part of that. Thank you very much, Maleki. And uh, perhaps uh, Isaita, um, in New York City, do you have civil society, active civil society organizations that are influencing and pushing you to do more? <laughs> Please share your experiences. Of course, uh, yes. Uh, in New York City, we have a very strong and a very active um, civil society uh, network of individuals that are interested in different parts of transportation and in making sure that New York City accounts for all of it, right? So again, kudos to all of the civil society organizations, not just in New York City, but around the world, because you also serve as an accountability mechanism. Um, I think that you keep the private sector accountable, you keep uh, governments accountable, and we thank you for that. Um, in terms of what civil society can contribute, I think for me, 
the first thing is awareness raising. Um, it breaks my heart every time that I am um, in New York City or in anywhere uh, in the world and we hear about cases of fatalities related to um, road safety and it really is a preventable issue and I think that we need to do more to educate people about the fact that they need to use seat belts. We need to educate people about not drinking and driving or drinking and taking a bike. We need to educate people about the fact that they need to ensure that when they are on the street that they're not only thinking about themselves but that they're thinking about everybody around them. And that is the prime spot for civil society. Um, and I think when we look at countries like Guinea, where I am from, where we see so many people passing away and dying from road fatalities, we actually need civil society to step up, to do campaigns within the communities, to do outreach, um, and to really help the communities understand what is right and what is wrong when it comes to being on the road and to them providing the resources along with government. So you have a huge role to play. And I hope that more civil society organizations are going to step up to make sure that you play that role. Yeah, thank you very much, Isata. And I think, yeah, I, I totally agree. Civil society organizations play a powerful role in reminding the government accountabilities to deliver. And, and we highlight the data, the, the data that shows the tragedy of our, our loss and, um, and, and the, you know, living with someone with a serious injury and, um, and, and listen to that data. And what can we do that will um, reduce deaths and injuries into the future? Um, so uh, promoting the uptake of evidence-based interventions. Um, so we have another question and I will end with this um, from Lawrence um, Akugizibui. Um, his question is, in a bid to mitigate climate change impacts, what can nations do to reduce carbon emissions from highly industrialized countries? Remember, climate change has no boundaries. And that's very true. So I think this this question, um, yeah, I think we need to hear from each one of you panelists. Um, climate change is no boundaries. Um, what can nations do to reduce carbon emissions from highly industrialized countries? Shihab, would you like to start? Okay. Um, as you, I answered before, uh, we need to shift our paradigm. We need to uh, depend more on active mobility and the micro mobility as an alternative uh, way to uh, for for transport system. Um, and uh, I think that uh, for sure he will find a lot of uh, of uh, good tips for governments to follow uh, within this uh, fruitful uh, event today. Thank you very much, Ihab. Um, yes. And I, yeah, and that that's a really nice way to also re reflect on, on the entire um, discussion we've been having and um, and making a, a a nice concluding remark. So thank you very much, um, Maleki. Um, do you have a, a comment? I really like the question because uh, there is an unresolved debate where people are saying who is polluting more, who is polluting less, and we can look at it in many ways and. Some are arguing that uh, they are less polluted. Others are saying uh, some people need to pay more for the pollution that causes climate change and all that, uh, especially the emissions. My uh, the idea I think of is the countries that are less polluted. What can they take action now? make sure that they don't follow the pathway they're talking about. They don't need to create industries that pollute. They don't need to be using vehicles and systems that are going to destroy the environment. So if indeed they are less polluted, they are less affected, they're in a position to take more proactive action not to go that pathway. And that's, to me, is why can they follow that pathway now or begin pursuing it now so that they avoid the huge climate change impacts 
that they're going to face in 50 years from now. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Malaki. And um, as we said at the beginning, the clock is ticking and we need urgent actions and we need to start now and uh, we need to build um, uh, actions that will result, uh, will deliver results um, on an annual basis so we can meet our targets. Um, and I, I think that's a, a nice summary for us as well, coming from you, Maleki. Um, thank you very much. Um, so Aisaita, um, if you could give us a, a response and a concluding remark around and, and your reflections of all the discussions today. Hey, um, thank you for the question. And I think if there's anything that anyone should take away from what I've shared, on the New York City perspective, it's that we're interlinked uh, and we have to work together to make sure that we uh, protect our planet, that we protect our roads, because at the end of the day, that means that we're protecting our people, not just New York City people or people from Kenya or people from Egypt, but meaning the global community, all of us as a shared humanity. Um, and in New York City, we're often quoted at saying that what happens in cities affects the world, and we still believe that. So I think that uh, the question is spot on when it comes to the fact that these disasters do not know boundaries. Uh, we humans have set these boundaries, but the disasters, the pandemics, everything, they don't know boundaries. So we have to share our knowledge and we have to share our resources. As a city, we have committed to becoming carbon neutral by 2050, and we are doing a lot to reduce our carbon emissions. I mentioned the work that we are doing on retrofitting our buildings and making sure that we are reducing emissions from the buildings, but then we're also working to increase the use of electrical vehicles and to make sure that we transition toward low carbon fuel um, from low carbon fuels to renewable natural gas and hydrogen um, across the city. So I think that um, when it comes to the idea of what does the future look like, that depends on all of us, right? So if we all decide to work collectively together, which is why the UN is so important, it's the idea that we are all connected. So if we work all together, I think we have a better future, a greener future, a sustainable future. If we decide to continue to work in our silos, then we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. And I think the future generation, the young people are not going to allow us to do that because young people, we like to work together and we know that all of us matter, regardless of what we believe in, who we are, what our sexual uh, expression and orientation is. So that's what I leave us with. I'm really honored to have been a part of this discussion. And I really uh, thank Hawa, Judith, and everybody on that team for inviting us and giving us this platform. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Hi Sata, and you're absolutely right. And I think this whole um, session um, on road safety and climate change has really highlighted that um, we should not think of these two SDGs as conflicting competitions, but there's a lot of linkages and synergies and, and there's a lot of things that we can do that will benefit both road safety and climate change. And I think that's a really good way to start prioritizing what is it that we can do right now and, and build and continue to build. And um, so we, we all know that financing is limited, but let's use that limiting financing towards those interventions that will produce benefits for both climate change and, and road safety. And I, I think lowering speed limits, 30K speed limits, um, modal shift to public transport and making um, walking and cycling more attractive listening to our youth because they're the ones who are going to inherit um, our decision making today. Um, all those things, uh, I think they're, they're the uh, critical um, messages that are coming from our excellent panelists today. Thank you so much to each of you for bringing um, and sharing your expertise and your experiences and making this a really um, a rich and um, interesting uh, discussion and I think time flies. <laughs> it's um, past for four minutes of our um, scheduled time. So I will um, bring it to an end and thank you again to um, Hawa Judith um, from the um, UN Civil Society Unit and, um, and all, of course the FIA Foundation um, for organizing this event and, and bringing our attention to this two important 
um, the topics, uh, the global agenda items on climate change and road safety. And I hope or every one of you who has been listening and, um, and viewing us, I, I hope that you have some a good takeaway um, that now you can bring to um, back to your office and, and, and hopefully inspire you further to continue to do the great work that you are doing out there. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for your engagement and, um, and, uh, and, and the questions of the people who have given us questions to challenge us and, and consider further on how we can improve. Thank you to all um, again. And, um, and uh, yeah, I will now conclude the session. So um, have a great day or good night, <laughs> good morning, wherever you are in the world. <laughs>